What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I am super excited to share my discussion with Raised by Wolves creator and showrunner Aaron Guzikowski. We talked about working with Ridley Scott, the process of writing the show, and got a few hints about Earth's history, the forest whispering to Marcus, the creatures on Kepler 22b, and more. Here's our conversation. First thing I wanted to start with is something I'm pretty sure the audience is dying to know which is a few episodes back, Father started to tell a joke. I think it went, an android, a black hole, and a glass of milk walk into a bar. He gets interrupted. Will yeah. we eventually get to hear the punchline to this joke? I, I think we may. I think it, it may take some time to finally get there, because as you can tell, tell by the setup, it's an epic joke, you know, when you're talking about black holes and, and milk and such. Yeah, yeah, yes. but eventually, eventually we're going to get to the the punchline on that one. That's going to be the, um, I, was, I was wondering, how do you beat the season finale, giant dinosaur-sized flying snake? So series finale, five years from now, it'll be the punchline. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's the only way to, to, to outdo the snake. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, on a more serious note, you know, when I first started watching Raised by Wolves, you know, watching that first episode, the thing I kept thinking is that this really feels like a creative vision, just totally unimpeded. It's a unique show, hard sci-fi, really exciting to see. But like I said in the intro, it's not the kind of thing I would expect to find on a mainstream platform. And I'm just curious, did you face any challenges trying to get it made, having to sort of sell people on the ultimate vision you were going for? Um, you know, at, at first it was, it was definitely a worry of mine, you know, how it was going to be executed, you know, if in fact we were able to get it on the air that, you know, someone would try and change it into something more, you know, uh, recognizable sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I wrote it on spec, so I, I was able to kind of write it in a vacuum. So, and then once I did that, I went to the Scott Free people and I hooked up with them as producers, but, um, and eventually Ridley got involved. But when Ridley decided he wanted to direct, mm -hmm. that helped a lot because Ridley just bought into, you know, he, he knew what it was. He wasn't, you know, into what, it, you know, what the goal was here. And, and he shared that goal and that helped protect it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I think having him on your side and, you know, and trying to you know, turn you know, to realize something that, you know, is kind of hard to, uh, to express in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but he got it. And that helped a lot, you know, just in terms of keeping uh, everyone else from freaking out, you know, during the, right. making, you know, sort of thing. So I think the steady hand of Ridley Scott definitely helped a great deal in terms of everyone just kind of backing off and being like, okay, let's, let's see how this, turns out you know let's not you know mess around with this too much um and thank goodness because uh, i think uh we uh we benefited greatly from that yeah he's not a bad person to have on your side i've got to no, imagine not at all <laughs> he's definitely not definitely makes a big difference absolutely <laughs> And how do you uh, how do you tackle starting to write a show like this? You know, I'm thinking about before you put pen to paper for that first episode, there has to be so much world building behind the scenes. I imagine stacks of notebooks where you're designing. How do we get from where we are today, 100 plus years from now, where Mithraism comes back? So did you start with the world building and coming up with all of that? Or does it start with the story of mother, father, and then kind of expanding from there? Um, I definitely, the world building had been going on for, for many years, um, because I, I wanted to do a science fiction thing and I had a lot of ideas. I didn't really have my, my characters, my way into it, but I had been thinking about this planet for a long time, this, this arc, a lot of these different aspects, uh, to the story, you know, maybe over the last, you know, eight years or so, it's just kind of in the background while I'm working on, you know, other stuff. And uh, it wasn't until like maybe three years ago, that's when I came up with the idea of the androids that raise human children, this mother and father. And that that kind of uh, became a great vehicle into all of this other stuff, I think, because if you don't really have, you know, that way in, you know, you can you can create a really great layered world, you know, mm -hmm. but if you don't have the right, you know, the, the motor that the audience is going to be able to hop on and, you know, to take them through all of this in a way that's going to be exciting, um, that's that's the real that's really the hard part mm -hmm. you know, for me, you know, coming up with that. Um, but yeah, it was many years in terms of all the, the different, all the minutia and all the kind of the layers and the history. Actually mentioning the androids, that's another point I really wanted to ask about because I feel like we've seen a lot of androids in film and television, but Raised by Wolves, in my opinion, had a pretty unique take, especially when it comes to Mother, where she strikes this really interesting balance between genuinely emotional at times, but in other cases, almost unsettling and how not quite human she is. 
I was yeah. wondering if you could talk a little bit about how did you develop the look and feel and the voice for for all the androids we see on this show? Yeah, well, they're all very different. You know, I think, um, you know, mother and father, uh, you know, as we say in the, the show, very different kinds of androids. And mother is a necromancer. Father's this generic service model. They're, you know, he's kind of like a Ford truck. She's like a nuclear bomb, essentially. You know, this billion dollar, you know, highly sophisticated uh, weapon. Mm -hmm. But when it came in terms of like how they would behave, you know, I think some of it comes, you know, ready made in some respects with the actors, you know, with the mm -hmm. casting. And just the kind of their the things that they're just kind of already kind of built into their behaviors or things that they're easily able to kind of tap into. Um, and beyond that, I think because they kind of have to have sort of just a natural affinity to just kind of get it. Because I think if you think overthink it too much, you know, I'm an android. It, it, it's really difficult, I think, for a lot of actors to wrap their heads around it. So I think, you know, Amanda just kind of clicked in really quickly to her approach. Um, and everything kind of just, you know, came from that, you know, a lot of, a lot of it just comes from with the, with the actors and what the way they're kind of approaching the role right. and the stuff that's just naturally happening with them. And I think, you know, we wanted to look at, you know, I think with Amanda, there's a lot of like animal type influences and in her behaviors and things like that. And, and, and also this idea too, that, you know, with mother and father, that they're not really, you know, they, they do a pretty good job of parenting, but they're not really changing these human kids as much as the human kids are changing them, right. you know, and making them more emotional and, and kind of, you know, creating these new complex behavioral al algorithms inside of them. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of seeing, you know, them becoming even more emotional as the, the series goes on. And in some ways, uh, becoming more emotional than humans in a lot of ways, you know, becoming, you know, and maybe starting to even manifest new senses, you know, things that maybe we're not even aware of, you know, that we can't even take in, or maybe we used to be able to take in, but now no longer can. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of looking at it, you know, through these different, you know, animals, you know, different sorts of, uh, you know, humans who are kind of on the, the spectrum and, you know, different, you know, behaviors that, you know, kind of manifest in those sorts of cases. And all these sorts of things kind of went into the, you know, the building of, uh, of you know, that, that behavior, what, what they're really going to, you know, look and feel like. And then for the look, I mean, I uh, credit Ridley with the, the skin suits, hmm. you know, um, that was just like this, this idea he had. And I love, you know, I loved it from, you know, I love the idea that it makes them almost seem kind of naked, like Adam and right. Eve sort of thing, but also you never forget that they're androids, mm -hmm. you know, they have, they always seem like an other, you know, sort of thing. Cause it, they're not the sort of Android who are trying to pass for human, you know, that's not really what their job is. And so it actually helps, I think, to just mo every time they walk on screen, you know, oh, it's an Android, you know, there's no sort of, uh, they're not blending in in any way, shape or form. So, uh, so those costumes, I think, did a lot of uh, work for us in terms of all that. The actors don't, don't love the costumes, but uh, <laughs> the, costumes, uh, the costumes work well for story, yeah. Yeah, definitely a testament to their dedication to, to the roles. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, they're they're not comfortable. They're super hot, and uh, they go through multiple versions of them. They have like hundreds of those things made because they they get ripped and screwed up so easily. So, I was gonna say, I had an idea for uh, my Halloween costume this year, but hearing how uncomfortable they are, maybe I'll pass. <laughs> you should go for it anyway. Just go for it. Absolutely, that sounds good. <laughs> It'd be great. Um, speaking of androids, a, uh, Carl was one of uh, I think a quiet sort of fan favorite. He was just. Yeah join the show and then so quickly we lost him is there yeah. any chance we'll see another carl or carl like medical droid in uh, in season two uh it's possible it's possible i think carl you know there are, it, you know obviously he had uh you know specifics to his his behavior but i imagine there are other carls out there uh for sure you know that so he was mass produced probably on some level um but you know he was unique in the sense that you know his situation and uh, his right. relationship with his brothers and, and so on and so forth um and carl is a great you know he is actually the same actor that played the medical android in episode two. Oh, and, okay uh, and that actor was so great uh just so fully you know and ridley loved him everyone loved him. he was just so he had very few lines he actually had a whole bunch of lines in episode we had to cut because there just mm -hmm. wasn't room for it but he was so great as this android and physically he was you know, he's a very slim man, you know, he actually looks like a machine if you put him in really tight clothing sort of thing, uh, which was part of the, the casting process with him. But we loved him so much. So when I was doing Carl, I kind of wrote to that actor a little bit to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, fully uh, explore what this guy uh, was doing. 
And, uh, but yeah, I love Carl too. I, I too would like to see him come back. Yeah. He was, it was just a great example of kind of what we were talking about before where he sounds like an Android. He doesn't sound overly emotional, but no. there was that melancholy undertone as he's watching all of his brothers, like you said, get drained of their uh, Android blood. So yeah, yeah, it was just a great highlight from the season. I thought. Oh, that's great to hear. Cause I, I, I loved, I loved Carl quite a lot. It was an interesting, uh, writing process with Carl. I just remember, many, many drafts of uh, many different uh, individuals uh, taking up Carl's space there. And eventually mm -hmm. it became Carl and then it all uh, made perfect sense. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. And I'm um, talking a little bit more about the writing process. I think one of the themes that raised by Wolves Explorers is that relationship between creations and their creators. And thinking about Ridley Scott, I think he's explored some similar themes. And I think often sort of with a, a little bit of a cynical view, if I look at Blade Runner, humans were essentially enslaving replicants. Or if I look at Prometheus, our creators want to destroy us. In Raised by Wolves, you know, we're still going with the series. I think the jury's kind of still out. You know, on one hand, we see how, the, how Mithraism may have accelerated Earth's destruction. On the other hand, you see what seems like genuine love that Mother has for her creator. And I'm just curious, working with Ridley Scott, did you ever find your points of view conflicting at all? Was there a back and forth that was part of the creative process in terms of what we, you know, eventually saw on screen? Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, these are themes he's been working with, you know, for quite some time. Um, and, you know, he still is, you know, super, we all are just, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be human and mm -hmm. trying to ask these sorts of questions. And uh, so I think, you know, in terms of the creator creation thing, I mean, obviously, I, I think we both agree that it's kind of unknowable that, you know, whatever artificial intelligence decides the world is supposed to look like, or whatever, you know, actions it takes to change the world. Um, I, I feel like it's completely unknowable. I think the idea that they'll oppress us and uh, destroy us or whatever it is, is a possibility, but I also find it absurd that we would be able to predict it because if we are really talking about something that's a completely different intelligence, like I think they, they did this thing and uh, Facebook was working on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And at one point they had two, uh, you know, two AIs that started talking to one another and they didn't know what they were saying. And they just started talking, they were communicating, but they had no idea what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what it's going to be. I, I don't think we're going to know. I think things are going to start to happen that won't make any sense to us whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's what it's going to require. Um, so yeah, I think we, we have a healthy respect uh, slash a little bit of fear, but also I think a little bit of who knows, you right. know, too. I, I think it's a little too, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, it seems very credible that, you know, it could all go terribly wrong for sure. Um, but just how it might go terribly wrong, I feel like it's, who can say, you know, I think right. if anything, the one thing we know for sure now is that we're terrible at telling the future, you know, human beings, you know, whenever it's like what we thought 2020 was going to look like, or, you know, what yeah. any <laughs> look like really 1984, you know, or like 2001, right. uh, sort of thing, you know, it's like, we're pretty far off the mark usually. So, uh, I think, uh, hopefully that would be the same here. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a pretty fascinating way to think about it. And to your point, we're already sort of on the brink of not being able to understand exactly what machines are thinking. You can yeah. develop an algorithm like Facebook has to, you know, help moderate their website. But I guarantee you there's not one human that could explain everything it's doing. Right. Exactly. So you extrapolate that 100, 200 years from now. It's a slightly frightening thought. Slightly, slightly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to say the least. But uh, but who knows? Maybe it'll be a. A perfect utopia. Maybe AI will be the, the greatest thing ever. I don't know. Who the hell knows? I guess it all depends. I mean, at the end of the day, you would imagine that AI would still want to save the planet on some level, you know, would still want some of the same things that we want. Right. Um, but, um, but again, who knows? So um, speaking of which, I've seen some debate online over how should we think about the timeline and the history on Raised by Wolves? Is it yeah. meant to be we start with our reality in 2020 and extrapolate one, 200 years, or potentially are we looking at an entirely alternate history, alternate timeline? Um, I won't definitively answer that. Yeah. I think there is a possibility that there is, you know, some difference between, you know, the world we're living in now and the 2020 world as it existed in Raised by Wolves. But I can't say for sure because it would sort of um, it would upend a few things. Okay. Um, but it is a question I think that's worth asking for sure. 
Okay, perfect. And um, digging into the history a little bit, I mean, to the extent you can, and and always feel free to say pass, you know, wait for season two onward. Um, But another topic of discussion has been how we ended up where we are today, where it's basically, or today in the show, Mithraism versus atheism. Because if I think about today, atheists are, I think, a pretty small minority in the world. So is there a reason why they would have been able to survive when the rest of the religions seemingly fell to Mithraism? Or is there more going on here? Have other religions maybe joined up in with the atheist army to defend against Mithraism? Or is this uh, an open question? Uh, I think, I think, the, so the way it happened was, I think there, as you said, there were many different religions mm-hmm. and eventually Mithraicism, you know, one by one is, you know, uh, basically taking them out until it's the only one left. And then everything, and then it's trying to basically convert everyone on earth. So I think anyone who didn't want to be converted, regardless of whether or not they identified previously as an atheist, had suddenly had to become one, in essence. Gotcha. You know, they had to, had to declare themselves like, I'm an atheist now because I don't like that. I don't want to be part of that. So I'm kind of forced to become this because there's nothing else really left. Uh, and everything's very kind of black and white by this point, you know, and they're trying to convert all of the remaining, you know, every person on earth to be, to follow this one religious code. Uh, so, uh, Hey there, uh, people at the window. Oh, gotcha. Thumbs up in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but in any case, so there were many religions, they wiped them all out. And again, I think it was more about branding the opposition. And after a while, you know, that's just atheism, you know, the, the gotcha. most simplistic uh, way of looking at it is just that they have to just deny the fact that there is anything. Um, and that's kind of what they have to uh, fight for. Got it. And it seems like the power dynamic is pretty weighed heavily towards the uh, Mithraic religion's favor with necromancer technology and yeah. and just seeing the tactics that the atheists are using, you know, child soldiers, it feels yeah. like more guerrilla warfare, and they're fighting against, you know, Goliath. Yeah, they're, they're highly desperate, and also the Mithraic, as you said, have access to all these technologies that they discovered were actually encrypted in their scriptures. Mm-hmm. So, sort of the how to make the necromancer, how to build the ark, you know, quantum gravity and dark photon technology. They kind of got the the sort of the secrets behind all of these things. Were able to build all of these weapons and whatnot, even though they don't really understand the underlying technology. Uh, but that also aided them in terms of taking everybody else out and forcing you know the everyone who was left to kind of band together as atheists mm-hmm. to to fight against them any way they knew how. You know, with child soldiers or you know eventually with nuclear bombs. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically just having to, you know, just go for broke and blowing up the whole planet because they didn't want to convert, uh, but they weren't going to win either. So uh, they were kind of forced into a corner in that regard. And um, so it, it seems like throughout the season, we've definitely seen hints of some kind of a higher intelligence or some kind of outside force, I'll say. Yeah. And um, I'd love to get into some some questions here. And, and again, like I said before, you know, feel free to just pass on any of these and say, Better to wait and see. Yeah. Um, but these are a few points people were debating online. I'd love to just pick at them a little bit. So sure. uh, on the Ark, Otho claimed to have heard a voice you know, en, en route to uh, Kepler-22b. Yes. Is it fair for us to assume that whatever was communicating with him is the same force that was communicating with Marcus, whispering to him once they were on the planet? I think that's a safe assumption to make. Yeah, yeah. And I think when he was hearing it, they were probably close to the planet, you know, uh, nearing it. So yeah, that is the, I would, I can confirm that. That is Okay. The awesome. In the finale, mother kills this hooded figure that was carrying a Neanderthal skull. Yes. And um, so should we assume that this is a different hooded figure from the one that we met when Marcus found those tarot cards or could they potentially be the same person? They are, they could potentially be the same person. You could potentially imagine that, you know, that the person, the hooded figure uh, whose lair that Marcus finds, Mm -hmm. uh, he also discovers that that said figure was watching the settlement, you know, watching mother and father. Right, he saw that makeshift map he put together. Right, exactly. Um, And so you could also, so he did obviously have some interest in that family and may have even followed, you know, mother after that point, I, you know, at, and it's in essence, it was trying to, you know, communicate something to her, um, you know, which you could imagine either to be uh, maybe even a warning, uh, so to speak, of some kind. Um, so, yes, there's a good possibility that that's they're one and the same. 
and, 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 that, and, and that creature is sort of a, a, a less devolved version of the, the creatures, the ones that are running around on four legs. This is of the same ilk as those creatures, but less devolved from that, from humanity. From the gotcha. Side. That was exactly what I was going to ask next. So it sounds like it was basically one link in the, the devolutionary chain between humans and uh, four-legged creatures we've been seeing. Exactly. Somehow this guy, uh, or at least his, came from a lineage uh, who were able to kind of slow down that de-evolution de process through whatever uh, means they were uh, Im implying there. Got it. Got it. And, and actually, speaking of uh, these, these revelations we've gotten in season one, I've got to imagine that with a story like this, where there is this big mysterious element to it, how do you strike that balance between how much you want to reveal now, how much you want to hold back on, you know, so giving answers at a sort of satisfying pace while still keeping us asking questions and holding back some of the revelations. Yeah, it's it's a tricky thing, but I, I think you, you try and I think, I think you can usually sense as the story's going along, you know, as you're working on it, kind of where these moments are, where, where the audience is going to need some contextualization in order to keep enjoying these character stories, in order to be fully on board for this stuff, but not to tell them things kind of before they're asking, you know what I mean? So to, to really try and keep keep as much, uh, you know, close to the chest as possible kind of as you're going, uh, but giving enough that, you know, we can get context on these character stories. Um, but really, I think it's about just really sticking with the characters and not answering questions before they're asked, you know, not giving, dumping out a whole bunch of, you know, here's the world, here are the rules, this is what's over here, this is what's over there, or, you know, just kind of, because I, I think what's good about this is it's all through the point of view of these characters, they're all on the ground, there's very little in terms, they don't know what's on the other side of the planet, you know, they, they we kind of only know what they know, mm -hmm. and so I think trying to keep in that sort of, uh, uh, that kind of, way of doing it where it's just, you know, only knowing what the characters know. And uh, I think that's the key. And, and you know, kind of treating the, how, the planet is sort of like a haunted house in my mind, mm -hmm. you know, and I think so in terms of, you know, figuring out, obviously, you know, there's certain mysteries that you've, you've got to hold, you know, for pretty much close to the end. And there's a lot of other things uh, that you don't need to do that with, you know, so to speak. Um, so, which is a lot of kind of rambling babble on my part to say uh it's it's kind of hard to say you know you just kind of i think instinctually know mm -hmm. and i think you want to kind of lean towards uh less revealing rather than more right uh but it usually fe it feels it usually feels pretty obvious when you need to do it mm -hmm. and then something needs to be known um but uh but yeah it's it's, it's hard to say yeah, I think the the key point that I heard is, uh, and one that I definitely agree with, is the fact that we're getting it through the character's point of view. Yeah. I think you risk frustrating people if the main character sees something and we don't see it because the camera didn't pan over. You know, it's this sort of oh, yeah. artificial mystery. But here, you, and you're exactly right, we're really with the characters and discovering things as they discover it. And, and it feels very organic. So I think you're striking the balance, you know? That's really great to hear. Cause that, that's what I love, just like as a viewer. I like, I like being really inside of the character. I, li I, love the, I, love, I love amnesia stories, you know, where the oh, character yeah. just wakes up and you find out as they find out, you know, what is this world? Where am I? Who am I? Like all that kind of stuff. Um, yes, it's always fun to do that. Yeah. And I'm um, speaking of revelations again, to the extent you can talk about it, I would love to discuss the cave painting that Paul finds in the finale. Wow. And that's definitely a moment that I think a lot of us freeze fit framed on and, and we're analyzing it as much as we could. And yeah. at a high level to me, if I look like, if I look at it, to me, it looks like mother and father in a vessel with a stash of embryos. I see Kepler 22B on the left side, and I think I see Earth on the other side. Looks to me like they're heading to Earth. Am I in the ballpark, or is this a, is this a wait and see? Uh, it's a wait and see for sure, but there's mm -hmm. definitely a feeling from that, uh, from that cave drawing that, yeah, it does seem to depict mother and father, which seems to denote some kind of time space issue that's going on. You know, how is this possible? This is an old, you know, obviously that was put up there thousands of years ago. Mother and father are, you know, not that old. Uh, you know, they just got here, you know, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so so how can this be? And, um, and that's basically all I could really say about it um, beyond, um, yeah, 
you'll have to wait and see on that one. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So one yeah. more reason I'm very glad we're getting a second <laughs> season. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> So there's one one thing I want to ask about a little bit selfishly because it's uh it's a moment that there has been a little bit of debate over online. It was uh, a kind of Yanny Laurel situation where I heard one thing when I watched it and a bunch of people heard one thing, a lot of people heard another line, and I was yeah. wondering if I could just get what is the definitive thing we should be hearing in this moment. Uh, yeah. So Campion is locked in the silo yeah. and Ghost Tally makes an appearance. Mm -hmm. And I thought I heard her whisper, kill yourself. And others have said they heard, kill your father. Oh, oh and that's yeah. the moment. Yes, yes, yes. She, it is kill yourself. Okay, kill okay. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. Though I guess, you know, later on he does stab his father. <laughs> that's true. But, yeah. uh, yes, but, it, but that was more of a, it, you know, a trying to escape sort of thing. So uh, yes, it's, it's something was trying to convince him to kill himself in that moment. Yeah. Got it. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, because uh, so all you um, YouTube commenter Ooh. haters, you heard it from Aaron. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to get you into any trouble. Oh, you know, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I've uh, upset, upset anybody. No. But I think that is the line. That is the line. All right. So kind of as we wrap up, um, anytime I talk to somebody like you that's had success in a field that, that many people have ambitions for, I just love to ask if you could talk for a couple minutes about how you got started and any words of advice you have for people who want to be writers and tell stories, you know, in the world of film and television. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, I, I took a very sort of zigzaggy way to get here. You know, uh, I started out drawing I, I, and a whole host of other things that weren't, but, but that did involve film and, you know, and visual and stuff like that. Um, and then at some point I just decided, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not going to be a jack of all trades, master of none. I'm just going to try and only write and not allow myself to do anything else. And that was about, uh, I don't know, like 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I, and I was working other jobs in New York, you know, just to, to pay the bills and stuff. But, you know, in the morning and at night, I just started trying to write a spec script that I could, you know, then use to hopefully get some kind of representation out in Los Angeles, which I knew nothing about. Uh, I had no contacts out there or anything like that. Um, but I did know that, you know, if you wrote a good enough script, you could probably, you know, get someone to pay attention to you on, on some level. Um, so I wrote a script um, and then started sending out these kind of wacky letters to people, you know, asking them to read my script, you know, totally clueless. I have no, you know, I, all these sorts of unsolicited uh, letters and whatnot. Um, but, you know, put a fair amount of thought into, you know, the comp you know, composing those letters and tried to make it, you know, uh, compelling and trying to get people to read the read my stuff. Eventually, someone uh, did read it and and they liked it enough to sign me. And and then I started just working on another script, um, which eventually became uh, Prisoners, um, which finally which I was able to sell and that and that allowed me to uh, to move out here. And I think the whole way through, it, it really is just it's just working every day or, or yeah, however you can do it. You know, whatever you're doing. If you have a job or whatever it is, you try and do it in the morning or whenever you can, you know, or just thinking about it if you can't actually do it or, you know, and just watching as many movies, reading as many books, you know, uh, filling your head with as much stuff as possible. If And if possible, filling your head with stuff that other people aren't filling their heads with is also really good. You know, finding these kind of outlets that not everyone is looking at, you know, find, going to weird bookstores and just digging out stuff that, you know, was, you know, uh, no, no one's looking at. Um, and just finding all of those things and, you know, filling your head with it and being obsessed, I think it helps a lot. And also too, I think wanting to see the thing that you're making, you know, like I have this selfish desire. I'm like, I really want to see this. I'm a sci-fi fan. You know, I want to see certain sci-fi things. So I'm like, well, I, ha I have to make it, you know, so how do I do that? How do I, you know, satisfy my own desires when I'm watching something, you know, and trying to think in those terms so you're writing more for an audience, even though you're still kind of taking it from this kind of personal place. Um, and, you know, and again, I think it's really just just being obsessed, just work, just doing it every day, every day. If you can do it every day, you're bound to get better. And eventually, you know, I think uh, stuff will happen if you're, you know, because if you are doing it every day and a few years go by, you must, there must be something going on. Um, so, uh, and just don't give up. I'd say uh, Woody Allen once said, uh, just stay in line. Don't get out of line. <laughs> it's like going to the deli. <laughs> if you get in line, stay in line, you know, uh, just keep eventually you'll get your sandwich. 
eventually you'll get your sandwich <laughs> if you stay in line. It could take all, who knows how long it'll take. But, uh, you know, if you're in line and, and, you, and you have your money when you get up to the thing too, that's the other thing I think is when always be generating stuff. So if, if something great does happen, you have a bunch of stuff, you know, because it could be like, oh, great. Yeah, you, you wrote a spec script and, and people like it. They'll be like, this is great. Uh, but what else you got? You know, what else you working on? And if you don't have all that stuff kind of ready, that could be a that could be a critical moment that you're going to screw up because it's your mind will be crazy because you're like, oh, shit, uh, they like one of my you know, they like my stuff. Uh, then your brain is going to be all over the place for weeks right. you know, you're, and you're going to be trying to come up with new stuff at the same time. And it's just not going to happen. It's like I think you should always be preparing for that moment where you get opportunity. And then, so you have it all ready, you know, you, you, there's many you know, years could pass before this day comes. And if you're really using all that time, you know, to build up all this stuff, then, you know, if it does happen, then, then you got a bunch of stuff that you can really take advantage of, um, which is easy to say. I don't know that I actually did that, but uh, looking back, <laughs> I, think I did a little bit of that, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, just to, I can second all of that on a much smaller scale that even this, this YouTube channel, you know, I started out doing videos which would get 10 to 15 views. And I never would have thought that a year or two later, I would get, you know, a privilege to speak to somebody like you and speak to people that are, are making these stories that for the last 30 years, I've been enjoying, you know, just sitting on my couch or sitting in a theater. Um, but to, to be able to speak to someone like you, it's a privilege. And awesome. uh, yeah, thank you so much again for coming on. Um, and I just wanted to share one more thing with you, which is that I posted in a couple of places leading up to this, letting people know we were going to be talking and just saying, hey, do you have any questions you want me to ask Aaron? And it was just really clear the level of enthusiasm people have for this show. There were a few people who posted, you know, I trust you for the questions, but I just want you to forward along to Aaron my appreciation for the show. And just to thank you for bringing us great sci-fi that challenges us and just gives us something to talk about. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's amazing to hear. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks for coming on. I'm looking forward to season two. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Take it easy.